The saying goes that fact is stranger than fiction, but the same can be said for horror. Oftentimes the horror stories that unfold before us in the real world are so much creepier and disturbing than the likes of a Stephen King novel or a horror movie. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at five scary real life horror stories, from a creepy post on Reddit to a disturbing unsolved missing person case. Here are five real life horror stories. Before we dive in, we'd like to say a special thank you to this video sponsor, Skillshare. Wisdom and learning are fundamental aspects to life and growth. One of our main goals here at Top Fives is not just to entertain, but to teach and encourage our viewers to take their own journeys by gaining knowledge and learning new skills to hone their interests and goals. The mysteries on earth and beyond are accessible to anyone who strives to solve them. Whether that be through creative and imagination or technical mastery, we receive hundreds of requests from people around the world asking how they can make their own projects and jump into a world of imagination and discovery. Through our partnership with Skillshare, proud sponsors of today's video, we are presenting you with an opportunity to do just that, learning about creating. Skillshare is a community for online instruction built by creatives for creatives. Skillshare offers thousands of classes for people interested in gaining a new skill, whether it be artistic or technical, covered by topics ranging from film and photography to illustration and design. You don't have to be a master at your craft either. Skillshare is made for passionate beginners and those trying new activities for the first time. Many viewers ask how we keep our spirits high when producing such gruesome content on occasion. And through Skillshare, we found the perfect class called the Ultimate Self-Care Playbook, Discover and Nurture Your Centered Self, taught by Jonathan Van Ness. This course gives you everything you need to establish a self-compassionate mindset, but more importantly, instructs us how to be mindful and creative at the same time all lessons in the art of finding peace for the relationship with yourself. Through our sponsorship, the first 1,000 subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of the premium membership. And if you love it as much as us, you can sign up for just $32 a month on an annual membership after the trial ends with a generous amount of premium courses added each month. So no more waiting, tap into your imagination, embrace the calmness within you and join Skillshare today. Fulfillment and self-care are only a few courses away. And now, if you haven't already done so, hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. What secrets do you hide from your family, and will you take it to your grave? Ask Reddit is a subreddit, where people ask and answer thought-provoking questions. Most are just general questions about relationships and life. But every now and then, a question is asked that produces a reply that can be quite disturbing. A few years ago, the question was asked, what secret do you hide from your family and will you take it to your grave? As you would expect, it got a variety of responses from cheating in exams to cheating on partners. However, one answer stood out, and even if it was fake, just the fact that someone would think it up is disturbing. We won't tell it word for word, but here is an overview of the story. We'll call the man Tom. Tom was out with his girlfriend Deb and her friend Sarah. Tom couldn't help notice that Sarah put a pin in her phone every time she took a photo. So out of the corner of his eye, he noted what she was entering and put it in his phone. A few months later, Deb and Sarah were over at Tom's place and both of them took a swim in his pool. Sarah left her phone indoors. So as the girls swam, Tom took his opportunity to look through her phone using the pin he had saved. He scrolled through Sarah's personal photos, some of which were nudes, and he discovered she was talking to a guy called Jeff, who had also sent her some intimate photos. Armed with Sarah's pictures and videos, Tom concocted a plan. First, he broke up with Deb, but kept in touch with Sarah. He then created an online alter ego who he called Vanessa. For months, he worked at creating Vanessa until her identity looked real. Vanessa then started following Sarah on all of her social media and Tom knew that Sarah was the type of girl who always accepted friend requests and followed back. Through Vanessa, Tom then started blackmailing Jeff and told him if he didn't break things off with Sarah, he would leak all of his intimate photos. Knowing what he'd sent, Jeff broke it off with Sarah. Tom then tried to do the same to Sarah, again through Vanessa, saying she would expose all her intimate photos if she didn't stop talking to Jeff. But Sarah called Vanessa's bluff so Tom decided to change tactics. Fake Vanessa backed off for a bit until Tom could get hold of Sarah's phone again. 
Tom invited Sarah over to his place, where she mysteriously lost her phone. Tom promised to look for it, and miraculously found it the next day and handed it back to her, but not before he installed a spy app that lets him track Sarah's every move. A few weeks later, fake Vanessa again contacted Sarah, but this time she was armed with the conversation Sarah was having with everyone. Sarah confides in Tom about what is happening and breaks down crying, telling him about Jeff and that somebody had hacked both their phones and was blackmailing them. As Tom was known to be a tech expert, Sarah asked him if he could help her. What Tom did was convince Sarah that Jeff was Vanessa and it was him who was blackmailing her. Soon after, Sarah dumped Jeff for good and turned to her hero Tom who saved her, as she thought from some pretty distressing stuff being posted online. Sarah and Tom now had a shared bond and not long after they started dating. Four years later, they were married. Tom ended the post with the chilling words, months of planned lies, blackmail and espionage got me my wife. Corey Joanne Lamasta. On January 29th, 1994, two hikers searching for mushrooms came across a horrific sight in Pogo Nip Park, Santa Cruz. The naked, decomposed remains of a woman dumped in the middle of the trail and partially buried. With nothing to identify her, investigators who quickly arrived on the scene dubbed her Pogo Nip Jane. She'd been left in a shallow grave near a homeless campsite in the area, and it was estimated that she had died several weeks earlier possibly in late 1993. It was soon determined that Jane Doe was in her late teens. She had short brown hair, pink painted nails, and was described as being petite. Her case was ruled as a homicide because her cause of death was established as bludgeoning with a metal object, such as a pipe, which led to her skull being crushed. The advanced state of decomposition made it difficult for detectives to ascertain her facial features, but they were able to make out that she had a tiny heart-shaped tattoo between her left thumb and forefinger. Furthermore, her teeth revealed that she'd had a few cavities in her lifetime, which were filled with porcelain. An isotope analysis of her hair revealed that she'd traveled between Santa Barbara and Santa Cruz, although she had lived in Pacifica. With little to go on, however, the case of Poganip Jane lay dormant for nearly two decades, until 2013. On February 26th that year, the original lead detective on the case, Sergeant Lauren Butch Baker, was murdered in an unrelated crime. He had often spoke about wanting to solve and close the case of Jane Doe, but had been unable to during his lifetime. In honor of his wishes, the Santa Cruz Police Department reopened the investigation and started from scratch. They enlisted the help of a facial reconstruction artist and had a clay model for Jane Doe's face made. Six years earlier, in 2007, a family from Pacifica filed a missing persons report for their daughter, 17-year-old Corey Lamaster, who vanished in 1993 after running away from home in December. Corey's mother submitted a DNA sample for future comparisons, and in 2013, investigators got a partial hit. This led them to speak with Corey's adopted sister, who was living in Washington. She still had a fingerprint card from Corey's teen years, and passed it on to authorities, who were able to match the prints with those of Poganip Jane. Nineteen years after she passed, Jane Doe had finally been identified. She was 17-year-old Corey Joanna Lamasta. It had never been made public why the family didn't report Corey missing until 2007. She was reportedly a frequent runaway, who when she left home often escaped to Santa Cruz, and had been taken home by Santa Cruz police in the years before she vanished. Authorities have apparently agreed to only reveal that the teenager came from a troubled background. Despite being given back her name, however, Corey's case remains unsolved. A father and son seen traveling with her before she was murdered are persons of interest in the case, although they have never been named suspects. The son, Greg White, had passed away by the time Corey was identified. His father, Wayne, resided in Tennessee for a while, but he too passed away sometime after the identification. Investigators were able to question him on several occasions before his demise, but no charges were ever brought against him. If you have any information about the case, you can call the Santa Cruz Police Department's anonymous tip line on 831-420-5995. Creepy Hand 
This Reddit post was short and little information was given about it, but it seemed to creep out the Ask Reddit community, who had asked, what is the creepiest photo you've ever taken? Wookie Rage replied with this comment and caused a bit of a stir. It read, Me and my brother were out hiking when we came across this cool tree. We took this picture. Only later did we see the hands in the background. Take a look. Now we think this could be a setup, although it seems the poster is into wilding rather than anything creepy. But if it is genuine, to find that on one of your photographs would surely freak you out. What do you make of it? Just part of the tree, a hoax, or something strange. Stranger Under the Bed Back at Reddit again for this one, and this one is on the Let's Not Meet subreddit, posted several years ago by a 22-year-old woman who was moving stuff into her first apartment. She said that the door that led into the apartment locked itself automatically when closed, so she didn't look back when she left her apartment to go to the entrance of the apartment complex to get her mail. As she walked back to her apartment, she was talking to her boyfriend on the phone, and when she went back into the apartment, she sat on the bed to read her mail. As she opened the letters, she dropped her phone on the floor and it landed under the bed, so she had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. But as she did, something caught her eye. There was someone under the bed. The woman choked the urge to scream. The person was lying still with his back towards her and his head to his chest, so she couldn't see his face and he didn't appear to see her. In a silent panic, she picked up her phone and in a loud voice said, Sorry, I dropped my phone. I'm just going to take a shower and call you back. The bathroom was right by her bed, so she quickly walked in and quietly locked the door, turned on the shower and jumped out of the window. The apartment was on the first floor and immediately called the police. They told her to wait nearby, but to go to the other side of the street to see if anyone comes out of the door to the complex. The woman walked across the street and hid behind a car until the police arrived. There she called her boyfriend and he came straight over and shortly after the police arrived, she gave them her keys and they went inside. Moments later, two police officers came out holding a thin and tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy, but he did not resist arrest. One of the police officers who was standing beside her comforted her and later told her that the police found the man stood outside of her bathroom door with a kitchen knife, waiting for her to come out. This man had somehow crept into the entry door while she was collecting her mail and hid under the bed. It turns out he was a homeless person with mental health issues who was eventually admitted to a mental hospital. The police later told the woman that the way she acted probably saved her from a bad situation and had she screamed, things could have been very different. Owen Parfit If there was one thing Owen Parfit was known for in the 1760s, it was his stories. A former sailor and outlaw, the 60-something year old often spoke about the grand adventures he'd had overseas in the likes of Africa and America, practicing black magic, entering into illicit relationships, and doing things that weren't generally considered to be acceptable by society in those days. When he eventually returned home from his travels, suffering from rheumatoid arthritis and unable to walk, locals often said that his wild endeavors had finally caught up with him. As a young man, Owen had initially been doing an apprenticeship, working under his father who was a tailor, but he grew bored and frustrated and hated the job, so on a whim, he went off to enlist under the King's Banner, from here, Owen largely lost touch with his family. At first, he was able to get a letter to them on occasion, letting them know where he was and what he was doing. But after a while, those letters stopped and the family fell out of touch with him. When Owen finally returned to his hometown of Shepton Mallet in Somerset in the southwest of England, his parents were dead. The only person who remained was his sister, Mary, who was around 15 years his senior. She recognized him immediately, even at her elderly age and the siblings moved into a cottage on the edge of town. By all accounts, they lived together happily. It was either 1763 or 1768 when things took a bizarre turn. Due to the fact that the case is centuries old, there is differing information about what year it was when the following events took place. But what we do know for certain is it was a warm evening. So Owen sat outside to enjoy the fresh air. At this point, Mary was around 80 years old and was not fit enough to move her brother without help. 
A neighbour, Susanna Schnuck, assisted the siblings regularly. On this occasion, she helped Mary move Owen to his chair outside, before leaving again. Mary had work to do in the house, so she went back inside. When the elderly woman finally emerged again, Owen was gone. She asked the farm labourers across the street if they'd seen him. They hadn't. So she enlisted their help, and that of the neighbours, to help search for her missing brother. But Owen was nowhere to be seen, and he was physically incapable of walking anywhere on his own. So where could he have gone? How could someone take him in front of a group of labourers? But no one had seen or heard a thing. There were many questions buzzing around in Mary's head, but so few answers. There was no trace of Owen. It was like he'd vanished into thin air. Local gossipers spun rumours that he'd been taken by the devil or carried off by pirates who believed that Owen knew the location of buried treasure. But eventually the whispers died down and the case was mostly forgotten about. Then in 1813, the story started up again when a human skeleton was found during construction that was taking place not far from Mary's cottage. The bones were determined to be from a young female, however, and remain unidentified to this day. With the discovery of the skeleton came more pointing fingers though, and they turned in the direction of Mary. Some of the townspeople wondered if she'd grown tired of caring for Owen, and she'd suddenly snapped in a fit of rage or exhaustion. But she was an eight-year-old woman who received her only income from caring for her brother, making it seem extremely unlikely that she had the motivation or physical capability to carry out such a thing. The only other theory proposed by modern sleuthers is the idea that perhaps Owen wasn't really Owen, and he was only identified by his sister when she was already an old woman. Perhaps he was an imposter who needed care, or perhaps he didn't even need care at all, and had feigned everything. But if this was the case, then what was his motive? The famous author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, was known to be extremely interested in this case, but not even his clever and creative mind could come up with any explanation as to what truly happened to Owen Parfitt. So that's five scary real-life horror stories. We hope you've enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.